Baptist Church. Good evening. God is great. All the time. And all the time. God is great. great. So, for those that were here as we were rehearsing a little bit, I believe you were blessed. Um, because there's a song that I made them do that was brand new. And I'm hard-headed, so I said we're going to do it. So you guys are going to be blessed, too. But uh, let's open just with a word of prayer. Ask God to bless uh, this evening. And, um, yeah, so. <sighs> Dear Heavenly Father, in this chaotic day, um, we just thank you for always being there for us. Lord, I'm just so thankful for the music that you've you put in my heart. Um, I love being excited about songs, so I just want to thank you for that. Lord, but, uh, there's others that get super excited about devotions. There's some that are super excited about specific scripture. Lord, thank you for making us different and giving us so many things to look for you at inside of them. Lord, tonight as we sing a bit, as we share a bit, as we open your word, Lord, I pray that something somewhere will reach out to every single person that's here, to every single person that's at home watching, Lord, that you'll give them something specific that they can just sit back and go, wow, thank you, God, for giving that to me. So, Lord, we look forward to what you have for us. And we turn this time over to you and just ask that you bless it. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and you truly are. The only reason that we have to sing. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. So there's a new song. I don't think it's been out, but a few weeks. It might be a tad bit longer. But it's called No Hold on Me by Maddie Mullins. Now, I could not let go of this because the chorus, it says, No more shackles on my feet. The devil's got no hold on me. Jesus' blood has set me free. The devil's got no hold on me. He's got no hold, no hold. The devil's got no hold on me. So tonight, as you sing that with us, um, if you're unable to sing and you're just listening, uh, no matter what, I hope those words resonate in your mind and your heart and you realize that the devil's got nothing on you when you have Jesus Christ.
not too bad for first time rehearsal, right? Really good. I mean, that's pretty impressive. You've been through it twice. Yeah, I've heard it twice. <laughs> um, I really appreciate the lyrics of that song, and I'd never heard that until Kevin sent that to me today. And uh, you know, it's interesting because you can't, we can go through life feeling like the devil does have a hold on me. And man, I mess up, and man, I screw up, and I fail, and I falter, and I look at what I've done, and, and I see what I'm capable of in my life. And, and I can, I can look back and say, wow, he's got a hold on me. Praise God, he doesn't. Because Jesus Christ conquered sin, he conquered death, and he conquered the grave. And that's our hope. Uh, it is uh, awesome to see everybody here tonight. Welcome to our uh, midweek Bible study. And uh, man, it's good to see Dan here. Dan, how you feeling? Doing much better. He's been battling some things this week, and it's good to see uh, all of you here. Thank you for all those who are joining in on Facebook. Uh, just a couple announcements before we do get into our study tonight. Number one, I did want to remind you of revival. It is coming up quick. It is a week from Sunday. A week from Sunday, September 13th, 14th, and 15th. Mark your calendars if you haven't done so yet. We've got an awesome guest preacher, a man of God, coming down, uh, driving down from Louisville, Kentucky, to preach for us those three days. A man who uh, has just had a profound impact on my life, and I can just see uh, how God is using him uh, to just uh, not just further his, his own ministry there in Kentucky, uh, but also to light fires of those all throughout this country. And so I'm excited that we get to sample that and be a part of that here at Faith. Uh, so September 13th is a Sunday, 10.30 a.m. Be, Brother Mark Bishop will be preaching the morning service. Uh, we'll come back Monday at 7 p.m. That's the 14th. We'll be preaching as service starts at 7. Also Tuesday at 7 p.m. There will not be a Wednesday night service that week. So again, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Now, here's the best part, because we're Baptists, right? We all say amen. We've got meals after every service that week. Amen. Right? That's right. We got one. All right. We got some true Baptists here. So following the Sunday message on uh, Sunday, we're going to be going over and we're going to be having a, a barbecue meal uh, before the service on Monday and Tuesday at 545 is when we're going to start serving those meals. We'll be meeting also in the fellowship hall, and I think on Monday... We've got uh, soups, salads, breads, some light things. And then on Tuesday, it's Taco Tuesday. Who does not love tacos? So uh, uh, feel free to come. And uh, we are opening this up to anybody, any other churches and that, especially Monday and Tuesday. Uh, so invite your friends, invite your family to come take part of that uh, for our church family here. We have sign-ups out in the lobby to kind of help fill some of those food slots. If any of you are able to help bring any kind of foods, they are specific items. Uh, they are ones that maybe you can cook if you are a cook. If not, then we have things that you could just bring for us. Breads and uh, tomatoes and lettuce and all of those different things. But uh, please help out if you're able to. Uh, also, I just want to remind you about this Sunday sermon. I'm excited about this. I hope you will join us. Uh, I'm going to be preaching on depression. And God has really laid this on my heart over the last couple of weeks. And I was able to, uh, this past month, a week ago, this past Monday, go to a conference in Plant City and hear Pastor Johnny Hunt preach. Many of you may have, have heard of him, but uh, he was just talking about uh, some of the things that uh, our society has always been dealing with, but even more so now with COVID. People are away from each other. They're seeing all of the negativity on news. And people, especially Christians within the church, are really struggling with depression. And so God's laid a message on my heart. It's not done yet. He's still kind of adding things and rolling it out. But just pray for me this week. The title is called Defeating Depression. It'll be on Psalm 77. Uh, but just that you would come Sunday uh, with a mindset ready for that. Uh, maybe that's something you're struggling with, but it may be something that, that your neighbor sitting right next to you is struggling with. And you could be a real blessing to them to help them overcome this. Because depression is a dark deep hole, uh, but there is a cure for it. For, and we know what it is. It's God. And so I'm going to give people some ways to, to get out of depression, start living the life that God wants us to live. If you have your Bibles tonight, go ahead and turn to the book of James. And we'll be in chapter number four. The book of James, chapter number four and verse 13 when you get there. And uh, we are rounding out our study tonight uh, in uh, chapter four, uh, which means we've only got one chapter to go. We've been going through James for a while now, and uh, I hope you don't feel like it's drug on, because this is just such a rich book. We've got, uh, unless God changes things after today, 
three more weeks, and then we'll complete that book. And uh, pray for me as well as I uh, see what God would have us go through next. Right now, and I, I'm, I've never done this before, it's very deep, it's a little scary, but I'm thinking and I feel God prodding my heart to go through the book of Revelation. Verse by verse. And this, again, is a study that I've never taken the church through as a lead pastor because uh, it's, it is very deep. But I think it will open up a lot of discussion. And here's the thing. We're living. We are literally living that book as we speak. So I'm continuing to pray about that. But I do believe after we're done with James that that is where we're going to go next. So, again, we'll be in James chapter 4. And uh, verse 13, if you get there, uh, if you've been any part of this study with us and you go along, we know one thing about this book, and we know that the book of James has confronted us. James is a pastor. James is a man has not held anything back. This book was written to Christians. So we know everything in here. If you're a Christian here and neither tuning in, this book applies to you. And he's laid it all out there. And he's confronted us, and it's been uncomfortable, and it's ruffled some feathers, and there's been a lot of things that, that we haven't uh, wanted to hear. But here's the main thing that James has done is he's reminded us that we need the Lord. We don't just desire him. We don't just want him. We don't just uh, ask him to help us in this area and that area because it's going to make my life all peachy. No, listen, we absolutely need the Lord. Why do we need the Lord? Well, we need him, number one, because he is strong and I'm weak. Amen. Why else do we need him? We need him because he is holy and man, I'm sinful. Why else do we need him? Well, we need him because, praise God, he is sovereign. And this little puke of a man is anything but that. I am not. And tonight, we're going to focus on this thought because we like to think that we are in control of our lives. And we do like to think that, don't we? Man, we, we'll make these plans. We'll get into that in a little bit. And we think that, that we're making our own paths. And, and here's my goal. And, and here's how I'm going to get from point A to point B. And this is my plan. And this is my goal. And this is my strategy and my agenda. And here's how it's going to happen. Listen, you're not in control of your life. Big pill. Everybody swallow that big pill right now. Woo. Takes a lot of water. That hurts. But let me tell you this. There is freedom in realizing that we're not in control of our lives. See, we may sit back and think, whoa, whoa, whoa. If I'm not in control of my life, it's going to be chaos. It's going to be madness. There's going to be craziness in my life. No, no, no. Not with God in control. Here's the thing. When I can acknowledge that I'm not in control of my life, but that he is, then I'm free. Isn't that funny how that works? There's freedom in that. Not, not craziness. Not madness. He's in control. Of your life. There is freedom and humility. There is freedom and surrender. And that's exactly what James is going to teach us uh, in our passage tonight. But let me open with a, a question. And this is just if you guys have some stories or some examples to share. Uh, I've got one of my own. Have you ever made plans that got destroyed by completely unforeseen circumstances? And how did you react to that? Think about a time in your life where you had plans. I mean, this was ironed out. It was organized. You had goals. You were going to get from point A to point B. But something destroyed it. Would somebody have a, something that they could share? And how did you react when that happened? Not all at once. Anybody? Ms. Bev? Definitely detoured you off that path that you thought you were going down. Yeah. Wow. Anybody else have any plans that you had in life over something? It could be major, it could be small, but uh, it was destroyed. How did you react? Well, it wasn't destroyed, but it was kind of put on a sidetrack. Okay. I might have been staying in the Navy maybe 20 years. Okay. Yeah. I'd done gone to boot camp, gone to go to school training, and they closed the school out. Oh, okay. While I was in boot camp. <laughs> Okay, I know there's still printing going on out there. I can do it. And then about the first year in the Navy, you know, it's like school. One school plays another school, the ball games. Mm -hmm. I was playing football for my church group on the ship. And uh, 
God says, no, this is not your game. Yeah. So the menial meniscus was removed from the left knee. And when you can't climb ladders in the Navy, you can't stay in the Navy. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> a deal breaker. Isn't that's, it? that's just change sidetrack. I walk to the print shops and I print. I don't have to climb ladders. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll share mine. Uh, something that, that is kind of funny, if you know me, I'm a pretty organized guy. I, I am a planner. Um, I usually have, if, if I've got a goal, I will have steps laid out of how I can accomplish that. I'm big on this with vacations. I'm not like crazy or psycho when we have family vacations where I've got everything dictated by the hour, what we do. But I, I like to go into vacation and I know on Monday we're going to spend this much time at the beach and then we're going to go do putt putt and then we're going to go to dinner and then Tuesday we'll do this and Wednesday we'll do this. And so uh, this has happened. It seems like, praise God, the chain's finally broken because it didn't happen when we just went a couple weeks ago. But almost every time we go on vacation, I've got these grand plans. I am so thrilled. I'm just, I can't sleep for weeks. And then I get there and I either get sick or I get injured one way or the other. Uh, one year, it was, I think my wife and I had been married five years and we had just finally been able to take a trip. And we flew down to Fort Lauderdale. And I got us, uh, it wasn't beachfront, but we were pretty close. And uh, we had a week, I think we had the, uh, the smallest baby with us, which I think was Oakley at the time. And uh, we were just going to get away. And as soon as I got down here to Florida and got in my hotel, I started getting a scratchy throat. I started getting a headache. I wasn't feeling good. I started taking some aspirin and some little things. And would you know, that night I had like a 103 degree fever. I had strep throat. And I battled it all week, the whole week. And then we went back and started feeling good by the time we got to vacation. Uh, our honeymoon. So I thought, I'm going to do this big thing. I mean, we're getting married. And, I, you know, I've never been out of the country. So I told Jamie, we're going on our honeymoon to the Dominican Republic. We're going down to the Caribbean. And it's going to be a beautiful island. And we're doing all of these excursions. And all of these things happen. When we get married, we fly down there. And our second day in our resort room, uh, they have all the rooms are, are much like we have here in Florida. It's mostly tile. Uh, but down there in your, your mini fridge, if they have stock, they don't have cans. Everything's in bottles. So you've got the old Coke bottles, the Sprite bottles, whatever it was in the stock. I walked over after we got back barefoot one day, and I popped open that uh, mini fridge. And one of those Coke bottles tipped out and hit that tile floor, and it exploded. And I've never seen anything like it in my life. But I was just standing there. And a piece of that glass actually shot into the arch of my foot and just, just sliced it. I mean, I was bleeding all over the place. So we got that wrapped. Uh, I, I didn't let them stitch me up because we went to the doctor's office and there's roaches crawling on the floors and the walls and third world country. Uh, so I said, y'all ain't touch me. It, it was like $50 a day just to rent grudges. So I wrapped my foot. I mean, it was probably this thick of gauze. And uh, you'd say, well, you know, you can get over that. Well, it got worse. So we get back. Now, my wife's been out of the country. She's been in the Philippines and some other places. This was my first look. I'm just an American boy. I've never been out. My first time out of the country. She tells me, don't drink the tap water, but it's okay to brush your teeth with it. Just don't, just don't swallow it. <laughs> Man, this is why we don't listen to our wives. Hey, Amen. <laughs> so, so I'm brushing my teeth with the tap water. I'm not swallowing it. You know, I'm just, it's, I mean, she's been in the Philippines. She knows, right? Apparently, she's got guts of steel. I do not. <laughs> and we'll just say, I did not catch on. I got very sick that night. And by day three or four, I'm not getting any better. I'm still brushing my teeth with the tap water, reinfecting myself. So here we are. And uh, this is a memory that we have. And, and uh, I, I'm, not, I'm trying not to be crude with this, but we're on the beach. So here I am. Montezuma's Revenge. You've ever heard of Montezuma's Revenge before? You got to go, right? You got to go. And so here I am on crutches trying to get back to my hotel room. Have you ever crutched on a beach before? It's awful. It, you can't do it. You can't do it. So I know that was a long story, but that's, we have some, some uh, we laugh about that often. I had plans that got destroyed by completely unforeseen circumstances. And here's the thing. We don't always react to them well, right? It's easy to say, oh, go with the flow and, and you'll be fine. But we can get upset about it. I had these grand plans, and, and I'm excited about this. And now, I, you know, I can't even go zip lining or do some of the other things I wanted to do because of my foot. So let's begin in, in chapter uh, 4, verse 13, because James does have a lot to say about our plans and our goals as we round out our chapter tonight. At the beginning of verse 13, he says there, Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year, 
and buy and sell and get gain. Verse 14, where he asks, ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. And so what, what is James saying here? What, what is he getting at when he's, uh, when he's scribing out these verses? He's rebuking the kind of heart that lives and makes its plans apart from a constant awareness on the hand of God and with an underestimation of their own limitations. This is someone who's coming here and, and making their plans, and that's what they're doing in verse 13. They're saying, I'm going to this town, and nothing's going to stop me, and it, we're, we're going to take our business there, and we're going to sell, and we're going to make money, and then we're going to go back, and everything's going to be fine. Not a thought of God. Not a thought of God. Notice he says, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't know what's going to, what, what tomorrow's going to bring. Let me ask you a question, church. Are we promised tomorrow? No. Yet how often in our lives do we live like it? And I expect to wake up tomorrow, right? Well, I expect to be able to be here and take part of a revival in a couple weeks. I expect to celebrate the holidays with you guys this year and many years to come. But, but when I step back, whoa. Should I expect it? I mean, because I'm not in control of my life. I'm not in, I, I don't count my days. I don't get to decide when I pass or, or when I move on. Who's in control of it? Well, it's God. But I want you to notice this. James is not telling us here to not make plans. Okay, that's important. He's not telling you to not make plans. Why? Because we have to make plans. We have to. We can't go through life. Have you ever met those people? Maybe you are one of those that uh, I'm the complete opposite of. They just, by everything, go by the seat of their pants. There's no planning. There's no thought. There's no action. It drives me nuts. There's people like, what are you going to do today? Uh, I don't know. Whatever I got to feel like. And, and, and I don't know. For being more of a type A, you have to have a plan. You have to have something to do. James is saying, yeah, it, it's okay to make plans. Listen, you guys have to make plans to be here tonight. I had to make plans to, to study and scribe out this message and to be here uh, to lead you in it tonight. Uh, you had to make plans for dinner. Uh, you had to make plans for your vacation and what you're going to do or not do. Uh, you have to make plans in your family. You have to make plans with your job and, and what are you doing uh, uh, there and how are you going to advance. And so making plans is not the problem that James is talking about here. The problem is the attitude about the plans that we make. What do you mean, Pastor? Listen, he's targeting the making of plans, again, without considering God. This attitude that James challenged was far beyond making wise plans for the future. I want you to listen to what Matthew Poole says. He says, not let us go, but we will go. It's in the indicative mood, noting the preemptoriness of their purposes and their presuming upon future times and things which were not in their power. Spurgeon goes on to say this, notice that these people, while they thought everything was at their disposal, used everything for worldly objects. What did they say? Did they determine with each other, we will today or tomorrow do such and such a thing for the glory of God and for the extension of his kingdom? Oh no, there was not a word about God in it from beginning to end. They come here, and they're not focused about, this is what we're going to do for the kingdom of God tomorrow. This is what we're going to do for the kingdom of God next week. It was all personal. It was all business. We're going to this city. They didn't say, well, well if God allows it, we're going to go. No, we're going to go, and we're going to make money, and we're going to sell, and we're going to do all of these things. Listen to this quote from Spurgeon. There are two great certainties about things that shall come to pass. Number one is that God knows. Number two is that we do not know. Isn't that true? Man, that's hard. That's hard because we want to know. And again, we want to feel like we're in control of our lives and we're in control of our destinies and we're in control of our plans that we created, right? But we don't know. The only one that knows is God, the all-knowing God. So let me ask you this, and, and, and the answer is in verse 14. Why can't we count on our plans? When we make plans, why can't we, just as human beings, why can't we count on them? Does anybody see it? It has to do with your life. What's he say your life is there? Look in the middle of the verse. What is your life? And then he answers this question. It is a vapor. A vapor that appeared for a little time 
and then vanishes away. Have you ever seen a vapor? Sure you have. Maybe you're, you're brewing tea or you see uh, some kind of a steam or vapor that's out of like, well, you see it, right? You see it and it's thick, it may be very visible to you, but as it rises in the air, what happens to it? It's gone. It's gone. How long is the life of that vapor? Oh, man, it's seconds, right? He's comparing our life to that. You're here, you're thriving, but you're gone. That's why we can't count on our plans. He's asking us here to consider how fragile our lives are as human beings and the fact that we live and move only at the permission of God. Do you think that, that you, because you allowed yourself and through your own power, even got here tonight? Listen, everybody raise your right hand. Raise your right hand if you can. Raise your right hand. Raise your left hand. We're about to put Simon says, but I'm just kidding. Everybody wave your hands. Okay, everybody put your hands down. Everybody take a deep breath. Breathe out. Do you feel your heart? Do you feel your neck? Do you understand that all those things happen because God allowed them to happen in your life? You didn't have the brain power or my power to raise your right hand. God did that. Do you know if God didn't want you to raise your hands? You wouldn't have raised your hands. Do you know if God wants to strike you dead? He'd strike you dead. He's in control. Not me. We have to remember that. James does not discourage us again from planning and doing. Only from planning and doing apart from the reliance of God. We've got to remember that we couldn't even. We took our breath, right? That's a miracle. Every time you breathe, that is a miracle of God. That he would allow oxygen that he made, that he put in this world to go into your lungs. That it would nourish your body and your blood and keep your blood flow, your heart's pumping. Keeping your blood flowing through all of the veins and capillaries. That's not you. That's him. We are desperate and we can do nothing apart from him. Remember the story in Luke chapter 12. And we won't read that story tonight. But Jesus talks about a rich man here who had great plans for his future. This was a rich man who came and he had everything that he needed. And he had crops and he had supplies. And he had so much he didn't have anywhere to put it. He was like hoarding all of his stuff and it was bursting out the windows. So I'm going to go build greater and I build greater barns. Well, guess what? Then he fills up those barns. So then he's got more stuff. Well, I'm going to build uh, this barn and, and this. And it, it's almost like a biblical corporation that he's building here. Well, then his soul was required of him that night. Jesus called him a fool. He said, Thou fool, look what you've built. You've made plans, you've done all of these things. And you haven't considered me in all of them. And now tonight, you're going to die. And because you haven't thought of me, and you haven't repented of your sin, your soul's going to be required of you, and you're going to spend an eternity in hell. He was not in control of his life and in his future. When you look at me, and hold your place in James, let's do a quick Bible study. And I'm just going to read you guys a few verses um, of what the Bible does say about our making plans in control. So let's begin in Proverbs chapter 14. Turn to Proverbs chapter number 16, excuse me, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9. Proverbs chapter 16, and verse 9, and this one always smacks me right between the eyes. It says, a man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directed his steps. What's that mean? That means I, I make plans, and I think that I'm, I, I'm making my way, and I'm paving my own path. But I'm not. The Lord is. He's the one directing my paths and directing my way. Turn back to the New Testament in Matthew chapter number 6. Matthew chapter number 6. We'll hear the words of our Savior here. Matthew 6, beginning in verse 33. He says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take, therefore, no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Jesus comes here and says, stop fretting. And we use this verse often when we talk about worry and anxiety and frustration. But he so much applies here. He says, stop worrying about tomorrow. Stop worrying so much about your plans. I know you've got things that you may think you want to accomplish in three years, in five years, in seven years, and you're fretting about it. Listen, remember, I am in control. I've got it. You don't have to lay awake at night wondering, 
what, what life's going to look like next year. We're wondering if you're going to accomplish this goal in your life or that goal. Because tomorrow will take care of itself. Do you know a reason we should worry? We should worry if I am in control of my tomorrow. Praise God I'm not. He is. Do you view him as trustworthy? Is he able to handle your tomorrow? Luke chapter 12. Let's look at one more. Luke chapter 12. And verse, starting in verse 22. Luke chapter number 12, starting in verse 22. And this is directly after that rich man passage that we just talked about. But Jesus comes here and says, And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say to you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, neither for the body, what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the vows? And which of you, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? If ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you, the Solomon in all his glory was not a reign like one of these. He's, he's saying a very similar thing here. He's saying, look, I love you. And you're important, and I haven't forgotten about you. I know it's hard. I know maybe to, to you in your mind, your future seems uncertain. But remember these ravens. Remember all the fowl. They don't have a storehouse. They don't have a restaurant. They don't have a refrigerator. And I feed them. And I care so much more about you. It's reminding us there that he is in control of our lives. And it's not me. And we got to praise him for that. Because if we were in control, we would mess things up. Back to James chapter 5. Let's go on to the next two verses there in 15 and 16. James continues on and says, For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Look at verse 15. Do you guys think that that means it's, it's arrogant or it's prideful to declare any of your plans without first saying, if the Lord wills? Do you think that's something that we, we have to do every single time we uh, discuss a plan with him or somebody else that we should start it with, if the Lord wills? What do you think on that? What's he saying there? I would say no. This is just my opinion. Um, I think that you can get a little crazy at it. Let me, let me use a, a couple of illustrations with you. If, uh, if you're at a restaurant and you're sitting down and you've got your menu and the waiter's coming up to you and I'm being seen on Facebook. Now you're sitting there at the restaurant the waiter comes up to you and, 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 and you're planning, right? What do we do at restaurants when we're looking at the menu? We're making plans to eat, right? I'm starving. What looks good? I want to get me the best thing on this menu that I'm feeling tonight. And it just so happens that I'm going to have the chicken. So when that waiter comes up or waitress and they want to take your order, should we say, well, if the Lord wills, I'll have the chicken. <laughs> if we don't say that, are we in sin? No, it gets a little crazy. Okay, if we're here tonight and we're at the Bible study and I'm up here and, and I've been brushing my teeth with Dominican water again. And I say, look, I've got to go to the restroom. So church, let me just tell you, hold your place. If the Lord wills, I'll return after I go and do my business. No, no, we're not in sin if we don't say anything. Here's what it is. And I think Pastor Francis Chan, you may have heard Francis Chan. I think he describes this verse perfectly. See, he's saying this. The question is really, God, am I in submission to your will? Am I comparing myself to other people who I consider to be more arrogant? That I've overlooked my own arrogance. Okay, Lord, I recognize my life is in your hand. Every breath is a gift from you. So I surrender it to you now. What do you want me to do? To do. I think what, what James is getting at in this verse is not that you always have to front with if the Lord wills. And there's nothing wrong with that if you do. But here's the question is, does my will line up with his? Do my plans in life line up with his? Do my desires in my life line up with his? Is this your will, God, is the line that should always be running through our mind. Before you make any decision, before you go down any new road, before you uh, go down the open any new chapter in your life, that has to be our question. Lord, is this what you want? 
We're doing Bible time with our kids now. We've got them back in, and my wife is homeschooling, which is, uh, she is just one of the just best human beings I've ever met in my life, because we've only been doing it for two weeks, and I was ready to jump off the roof a couple times. And I only teach Bible to them in the mornings before I come in. But uh, we were talking, we're getting to the end of Jesus' life, and uh, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane before he's betrayed. And, and remember, Jesus retreated from the rest of the disciples, right? And he went over to the garden and he, he prayed. And does anybody remember what his prayer was? He asked the Father to take this cup from him. Lord, if you would, please take this cup. He knew what he was getting to go through. But then he said, well, Lord, uh, let your will be done, not mine. That should be our prayer. See, we have plans. But when we go to God and we ask him if my will lines up with his, if there's a difference, whose will do we go with? Well, we go with God's, right? We have to. We have to. If not, you're going to be opening yourself up for, for utter destruction. And then in verse 16, you'll notice he brings up boastings. And he's, he's brought this up multiple times now throughout this book, this pride, boastings. Another word there um, is arrogance. Uh, the Webster's Dictionary of that word is this, having or revealing an exaggerated sense of one's own importance or abilities. And the Greek word specifically there that's used in Scripture in verse 16, we'll see if I can pronounce it correctly, Alonzaniah. It's Alonzaniah or Alonzania. I'm not going to ever proclaim to be a Greek scholar. But that is the Greek word from the original Greek and Hebrew that the Bible was translated in. And that word means this, empty bragger talk. Empty assurance, which trusts in its own power and resources, and shamefully despises and violates divine laws and human rights. It's an impious and empty presumption which trusts in the ability of earthly things. It's this thought that, that uh, it's not spiritually minded. It's not thinking about what God wants. It's not what, what God's plan is for my life. It's thinking earthly. It's using my brain and not depending on God at all. Bible commentator Mofat says this, Alonzaniah was originally the characteristic of the wandering quack. Does anybody remember what a quack is back in the old days? Anybody ever heard of that? What if you had a quack that wandered around? He offered cures, which were no cures, and boasted the things that he was not able to do. These were the guys that uh, would go back and they would knock on your door. They would go down to the doctors and the hospitals and say, hey, this ailment that you've got, listen, I've got this elixir and this thing's going to have you cured. Hours. Or, hey, if you, you use this powder on that sore, that area in your life, listen, I know, I mean, and there's no FDA, right? There's no regulations. This is just some Joe Schmo quack off the street. And, hey, this is, you know, it, it can be powdered sugar. We'll put it on your feet and, and, and you'll be cured. He was just making money. And he was just making boastings and making claims that he had no right to make. I want you to notice that James says there at the end of verse 16 that you're rejoicing in your boastings. That's the word he uses there. It's evil. He doesn't say it's just not right. He doesn't say it's, it's just not nice. It's just a little bit wrong. But when we have boastings, and I'm rejoicing in them, and I'm holding on to them, and pride is welled up in my life, and I'm in control of my life, and nobody's going to tell me what to do or dictate me what to do, and this is my, my line, this is my path, and you're not going to get me off that. James says, Christian, that is evil. rejoice in our boastings because we're not in control of our life. God is completely. In verse 17 and we'll close tonight. James closes chapter 4 and he says here and this is a powerful verse. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Let's read that one more time. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin. How would you put that in your own words? Somebody put that in, in your 2020 words today. What does that verse mean? Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Anybody want to take a stab at that? Jacob? Well, if you know, then I would, I would take that on as like God is letting me know. This. So then if I go against it, I'm not just going against it. I'm going against really what God is telling me. Yeah, very good. Very good. James knows that it is far easier to think about 
and talk about humility and dependence on God, right, than it is to live it. Yet he makes the mind of God very, 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 very plain for us here. That as we know these things, as you learn truths about God, as we know the difference between right and wrong, right, as we know the difference between good and evil, we're not just to know them, but we are also accountable to do them. And remember, this is, this is a very consistent theme that we have seen all throughout this book, that our faith, a genuine faith, is proved by action. Remember what he says, don't just be a hearer of the law. It's great to hear. That's how we learn. That's how we're encouraged. That's how we um, uh, can, can, can build and grow. But we've got to be doers. Because if we can hear, and I can build a, a brain full of knowledge, and I know all the right things, but I don't do anything about it, what have I done then? Done nothing. Genuine faith will not just be hearers, but you'll do it. You'll prove it by action. But he says this when we don't do right, it is sin. It's not an oopsie. It's not a, oh, I'll get, get it right the next time. No. No, he calls it out for what it is. When you know what is right, when you know what is good, and you willfully choose to not do it, it is sin. It is sin. We as believers, we know what God's called us to do, right? It's in this book. We as believers know how he's called us to live. It's in this book. And now we are responsible to live it out by his grace. So if you're not living right, you're living in sin. If we know what he's called us to do, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be a multitude of things. And we're not doing it, it's sin. We've got to make it right. So in conclusion tonight, uh, what do we make about all this? Because this can be overwhelming. Let me tell you one thing. Listen, you don't have to keep it all together. We can sit back and say, I'm overwhelmed, and I don't know if I can hold this standard, and, and James is telling me this, and I read this, and John and the preacher said this two weeks ago, and, and I, I, can't, I can't do it all. I can't hold it all together. Good news, you don't have to. That's, right. That's why we depend on God. That's why we plead to him. That's why we, we beg him for mercy. That's why we're desperate for him. And when we look at how many times we fail and we uh, acknowledge and just understand the fact that I can't keep it all together, it brings me as a believer back every time to my desperate need for him. I can't do it, God. I can't. You have to. You have to. And he will. That's the sweet part. He will. So tonight, I want you to take a big sigh of relief. Let's take that breath again. All that stress, all those things where you fail, all those things where you haven't measured up this week, everywhere where you've just wanted to maybe jump off that roof and just uh, crawl in bed and, 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 and not come out of bed this week. Deep breath, let it go. Listen, you're not in control. God is in control of your life. We need to remember this, that our God is the one who holds all things together. And we can serve him and we can trust him with our hours and with our days and with our years. Is there anyone more worthy and more qualified to run and control your life? Would you want anybody else to do it? I, I love my wife. I pray tell I don't want her running my life. No, no comments, okay? <laughs> Go to us, no. Listen, we can trust God. We can count on Him. He's been good to you. And remember this, that there is great freedom. Freedom. And that's what we want, right? Freedom. There is great freedom in realizing that though we work and though we plan and we make out our agendas and we've got our goals in our life, uh, that, that we have got to seek to live our lives for the glory of God. Why? We do it under His sovereign care. See, if you don't serve a God who is sovereign, you're in a lot of trouble. You're in a lot of trouble. When I serve a sovereign God, that means he's sovereign over everything. He's so sovereign over all. He's sovereign over your plans. He's sovereign over the good times in your life. Praise God, he's sovereign over the low times in your life. So maybe you're a little bit of a control freak here tonight. I won't ask for any raise of hands on that because uh, those of us who tend to be like that, we really, really, really struggle with this when our plans uh, go awry. But just remember this, you are not in control. And if that hurts your feelings, let me remind you, you should be glad that you're not in control. You serve a perfect God who created everything around us. He created your body. He created your emotions.
oceans. He created oxygen. He created wonderful things for us to enjoy on this earth. And he's given you a wonderful, bountiful, full life. Let him be in the driver's seat. Don't be in the driver's seat of your life. Otherwise, your life's going to be full of frustration, anger, and pain when things don't go your way. But when we can acknowledge that God is sovereign, he's in control of me, he knows everything, and I'm just, I'm just following him, and I want to serve him, and I want to glorify him, life becomes much more easy. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for the study tonight. Lord, I know that it, it, it convicted my heart because so many times... Uh, Lord, even as a pastor, I know I'm never exempt from this stuff. I think I'm running my own life, and I think I'm running the show. And, uh, Lord, that, that I know exactly what I need, and I know exactly what my plans are, and I know exactly what lies ahead in my future. Lord, you send verses and chapters like James chapter 4 in my life, which tear me down. But I thank you for it. Lord, thank you for being sovereign. Thank you that there is no power, there is no principality, there is nothing in this world that is above you. And there is nothing in this world, including myself, that is going to thwart your plans for me and my life or your church. Lord, what confidence and peace there is in that. Father, as we leave today, I just pray that uh, we will hold on to this, that we'll look at the rest of our week, the rest of our life different, Lord. That, that uh, when things happen in my life, it's not because I screwed up. It's not because I messed up. It's not because you're mad at me. It's because you're in control and you have a plan. And your plans are always better than my plans. Your ways are bigger than my ways. Your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. Father, help us to rest in that and have comfort and trust in that. We have to trust in that tonight. And Lord, when we do that, I know we are going to grow, grow, grow. And that's my prayer for my life, Lord. And that's my prayer for all of us here at Faith Baptist Church, Lord. As we trust you and surrender to you. Submit to your control, Lord. We're going to grow. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.